Hi friends. Today I'm really happy to be joined by my brother, Brother Kindness. Brother Kindness uh, worked as a psychotherapist for 25 years. He is the father of two. Uh, and we are really good friends. He ordained five years ago and we've been uh, good friends uh, ever since. And it's been a while since I've wanted to learn more from him on the topic of deep listening. How to listen to someone. I'm not the best at it. And Brother <laughs> Kindness has a lot of experience. Um, so hope you enjoy this, um, this interview. So let's start with the simple question. Why listen? Dear friends, dear brother Promes, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a great honor to be here and to share with you. Brother Promes knows that this, thema this thematic is very close to my heart. It is very important for me, so I'm very glad that I can share. So let's see, let's see what will unfold. Um, the first thing when, when you ask the question is uh, because I like it. Mm. just like because I enjoy it and you experience it already with mm. me and I think many people around because th when there is joy in, in something we offer mm. it's already it's already amazing mm. so um, I don't know why exactly I have this joy but uh, I can feel it right away just mm. uh, being available for for someone mm. Because I feel when I give space to, to uh, this kind of moment, um, it's like going for a hike in, in the mountain or, uh, or diving in, in the ocean. It's like offering me and, and the other person the opportunity to discover a world, mm. a full world of sensations, emotions, mm. uh, thoughts, uh, maybe suffering, maybe joy, maybe wounds, so many things we can discover. It's exactly the same when we practice uh, sitting meditation and we come back to ourselves in a way. Mm. We, we are just like uh, adventurous people and explorers that likes to just go deep and mm. feel things and understand. And that's give me a lot of joy because every time when I... Uh, sit with someone in the deep listening session, I feel so, so nourished, really nourished. And the other thing I was contemplating a little bit um, is that practicing deep listening, offering me the possibility, offer me the possibility to touch something bigger than me. Mm. So it's not only like, I am here for you or I am listening to you, but it's something much, much, much bigger than that. So it's this connection with, um, with a kind of, uh, in, in the Buddhism world, we say uh, ultimate dimension. So something I cannot grasp, something I cannot fully understand, but something that I can feel, it's there. Mm. And this subtle thing, this subtle energy you can feel when you listen to someone, for me, it's, it's um, already awakening, mm. in a way. And in our tradition, we said, thanks to Thai, we said uh, that Nirvana is the extension of notions. So practicing deep listening in this way, not, not trying to grasp something, but just offering a space where I can be completely available for life, mm. it's already in a way nirvana. So just to give you a, f a feeling of what it is, if you really offer yourself to this kind of uh, deep listening moment, for sure you will touch those two aspects. First being nourished mm. deeply, and secondly, connecting with something much bigger than us. And this is why I, I like to sit and listen. Mm. 
so by making space for the other person as they are whatever is unfolding whatever is happening for them you feel you're taken on a journey yeah and this journey is enjoyable yeah exactly so let's come back um, to the release of concepts and expectations what can we how can we get there yeah this is very important how can we get there yeah. and also why do we need so much to label to put into boxes or to fix the other person when we when we sit with them mm. It's oh, thank you for this this aspect. It's a very important aspect because first, I invite everyone to check what is my my posture, my inner posture, and what 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 are my desires behind this this kind of practice. And first, I think the posture should be uh, effortless. So there is no effort to do. There is nothing mm -hmm. to achieve. There is nothing, nowhere to go. So it's fully, fully our practice. Um, aimlessness, I can say, in a way. If I put a label on it, if a word, it's aimlessness. So I don't try to do anything. I don't try to fix the problem. I don't mm. try even to understand what you're saying to me. Mm. It sounds a bit weird because we said in the practice we should understand and then from understanding we develop compassion. But what is real understanding? It's not, it's not coming from my, my mind. Real understanding is coming from my heart. So if I feel that suddenly my heart is opening, embracing you, embracing the situation, embracing your, your difficulties, your suffering, I don't need to go through my mind mm -hmm. to try to an analyze this. Where is it coming from? Why mm -hmm. you have this kind of suffering? And why still you suffer today? And what, what can I propose to you to less suffer? This is the mindset. Mm. And the mind wants that because he wants to be secure. He wants to feel safe. Mm. And my proposal in a deep listening session is to accept to feel a little bit unsafe. Mm. It's not always very comfortable to listen. It's the same when you sit on your cushion for meditation. It's not always comfortable. And it's part of it. So this uncomfort in the relation, the unknown, you know, this aspect, I don't know where I'm going, can be very, very sometimes um, very uncomfortable and give you the feeling that, okay, wow, I should maybe grasp something. I should maybe control a little bit the situation or I should maybe uh, propose something to, to lead the, the, the path. But... My practice and my vision and my joy, as I said at the beginning, is completely at the opposite of that. It's letting go, letting go. I accept that it's not comfortable. I accept that maybe I will have some emotions. As the listener. As the listener. I accept that I can cry. Mm. Sometimes I cry, I don't even know why I'm crying. Mm. But I just cry. And I just feel so good when I can offer that to someone. Mm. Because it's also uh, a real, real way of interbeing. Mm. We are not separate. So if I can offer you also space to welcome your emotions through my emotions, mm. maybe uh, this is the best gift I can offer to you without any words. You know, just because from mm. my presence, my capacity to, to embrace my emotion my difficulty there or my cry, mm. I offer you so much. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's really a journey where you accept at every step to go to the unknown mm. with a little bit of feeling of insecurity sometimes and safety and, and, and being a little bit uncomfortable. Mm. So would you say that um, by listening, you're offering someone else 
um, the possibility to use your nervous system so that now you have two nervous systems to together allow things to unfold and heal mm. yeah it's it's exactly that and not only the nervous system i think for me it's my whole body mm. my whole body and my all uh being in a way so mm. it's much more than that it's all all the subtle things we we don't we don't really see mm. we don't know exactly how to define maybe some of us mm. but some people they know how to define it so mm. it's very interesting so like en I, energy energy level energy mm. spirit mm. um we we don't realize usually but it's there and you can mm. feel it you yeah. know when you sit with someone Mm. And you feel the spirit is completely open, it's completely free, it's completely um, um, available for everything. Mm. Everything can unfold. I don't know if you ever experienced that in your life, being with someone that can offer, offer you a space where you feel that you can be yourself even more than the thing you touch already in your life. And you can just go and let the thing unfold wherever, wherever they go, mm. which form, which words, which emotion. Mm. So it's exactly that. So we, mm. we, in a way we can say we, we are in tune in the terms mm. of nervous system, but we are also in tune in terms of being. Mm. Because we are one, we know that we are one. Mm. So before I used the word interbeing, this is the, the meaning of that, that we are not separate. Mm. So we touch the oneness. We touch the fact that your path is my path. Mm. It's a reality. We, we teach that. Your suffering is my suffering. Your happiness is my happiness. But, mm. but how do we to touch that? Mm. And practicing this deep listening is the way to touch that. Deeply. Mm. So as you're listening, you're opening to the fact that, oh what you feel is affecting me right now and the yeah. quality of my presence is affecting you mm. and we inter are as we say in in in, in buddhism mm. and that's very sorry to continue but that's very interesting because sometimes we feel that listening to someone we have to protect ourselves okay and especially when we are psychotherapists mm -hmm. we can receive this kind of guidance in a way say oh you have to protect yourself be careful otherwise you will burn out and things like that but it's completely the opposite mm. because in this posture in this way of being you don't have to protect yourself mm. there's not there's nothing to protect mm. you, see, you see because everything is going through you passing by you but there's not nothing staying there in a way Mm. And if something touch you, you just let this thing unfold and you offer it as a gift to the relation. So what, what, where is this, the, the, the me, the space I have to protect? That's very mm. interesting. And then, because you don't put energy to protect you, you also don't feel tired mm. after one or two hours listening. Mm. There's no, nothing like that. I mean, you can feel a bit tired if physically because you sit for two hours and you have to concentrate for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's not this kind of tire, tiredness that mm. we can feel sometimes like being exhausted because you try to resolve something or you try mm -hmm. to put so much energy in this situation. No, it's the opposite. It's completely relaxed. Mm. Because in a way, you don't take anything in, but you let the thing going through you and moving into space in a way mm. so there is no protection so there is no effort also in this way mm. so i hear you use a lot of um, um space metaphors i think it's very interesting and i think uh, most of our friends listening can relate to this that in our daily life we live mostly you know go 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 do 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 and a lot of our emotions are not being heard and fully processed. And what you're saying is when you have someone in your life and it doesn't necessarily mean, need to be a licensed psychotherapist, it can be a spouse, a friend, a colleague, 
when we have someone who has this space to offer and we can we can feel it and we can feel like we can be ourselves and in that safe space of acceptance of understanding that we affect each other whether we want it or not um, exactly um, those unprocessed emotions can have a sense of oh I'm safe now if I need to talk if I want to be more seen if I want to flow that's that's possible right now so um, I'd love it if you could tell us your um, your path as a psychotherapist, uh, psychologist and psychotherapist. Uh, what did you learn at school <laughs> and what helped you the most? And also what are the things that you learned through your uh, clinical practice? And how did your practice of listening evolve uh, with time? Hmm. Yeah, first I, I, I have something present in me uh, connected to what we said before. So I will, okay. I will share it because I don't want to forget it. Because even if I say, okay, there is this process of being in, with a lot of space and I, I don't have to do much, I just, it's just going through me. There is, in fact, there is one thing I have to do. Mm -hmm. It's to be very aware of uh, my tendency to put things into boxes. Okay. To, to and my mind is all the time trying to fix the situation, trying to label what you said, what you think, label your behaviors, label your emotions, label your wounds. Mm. So it's a big tendency we all have because we, we, don't, we don't like to be in the unknown, as I said at the beginning. So listening is also... Um, uh, an engaged practice that where I have to be very vigilant mm. and because if I let my mind going in that direction then the person in front of me mm. will feel it disconnect disconnect right away so it's like it's like this vigilance offer me the possibility to let go right away like okay this is a, a, a thought this is mm. a, a the, the way my mind is working and I let this flow, I let it flow. If I start to lose my concentration, I will be caught in that. Mm. And then the person will see on my face. Mm -hm. This is the thing. Will feel on my, will think, feel on my body posture, my my way of looking at her that mm. there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. And then then something will shift in the in the, in, the, mm. in the quality. Less trust, yeah. less connection. Yeah, because we are we are very sensitive, so sensitive. Mm. So this is one thing. So if I connect that to my uh, past life as a psychotherapist, um, it's it's very interesting thing that first I am a psychologist. So I studied mm. psychology in the university in France. And uh, I became, uh, in France we said, a psychosociologist. So mm -hmm. my, my main field when I finished my study was how can we work between individual and groups and how do we relate mm. so especially in the world of work so mm. for five years my five first years i work on the field of uh, business world mm. and i was a consultant trying to help to find a way to put back uh, the, the person in the process of uh, collective uh, work, collective responsibility, collective production and stuff like that. And uh, I arrived with an, an ideal, a very idealistic way of thinking things. And I was very motivated, full passionate with that. Mm -hmm. And after five years, I burned out because I faced so many difficulties, uh, so many realities that in a way I, I, I lost my faith in, in humanity. In a mm. way, so it was very strong, because I realized that um, this this world 
this business world especially uh, was most of the time trying to manipulate an individual a mm. person to integrate into a process mm. but it was not really accepting the wisdom of of the the collective energy we can generate together okay. you know mm. so it was more a form of manipulation to make more money than to really trying to uh, build mm. a new way of being okay. together and co-create together a new world mm. and also i was not practicing at that time i, I have practicing I, mindfulness, mindful, mindfulness meditation. meditation anything i was running away from my suffering mm. because i lost my parents i was very young mm. so i have this kind of trauma in myself so i i couldn't manage to face that for almost 20 years mm. so i i was running away all the time so i did the same as a psychologist for my five years five mm. first years and then I'm so lucky that I, I went through this burnout because mm. everything collapsed. My body collapsed, my mind collapsed, mm. I couldn't continue. I had to stop. And this is, this is so important to stop, as you said before, mm. and to st start to learn how to stop and to turn back my, my, my view, my understanding f towards myself mm. first. So I stopped. I went traveling for two years okay. and then I start to develop this capacity to be with myself. And I start mm. my spiritual journey mm. in India at that time, in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, I went from, for, for two years like that in this healing process, it was very important, slowly, slowly turning, turning back to myself mm. and being able to embrace everything in myself. Then I came back to France uh, with my, my partner. We welcomed our first daughter. And then I started to work as a psychotherapist. Mm. Uh, that, that was my dream, actually, when I started studying psychology. But I couldn't do it before because I didn't touch my, I couldn't touch my own suffering. Mm. So how, you, how can you welcome someone if, you, mm. if you're protecting yourself from your own suffering? It's impossible. Mm. Because being a psychotherapist is accepting, as I said before, and also listening to someone in a way is the same, accepting that you will be touched. Things will resonate with your own Things will resonate. Suffering. You cannot be a kind of professional with a no. wall, you know, with a barrier mm. and say, okay, I'm here, mm. take him some notes, and then uh, what's your problem? Mm. Yeah. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People... Is this something you tried at some point, being that, that guy, that uh, psychotherapist? I, I didn't really try that, but I remember at the beginning, I shared the other day with you, I, I, I was also looking for a way to be in this kind of skin, you know? And so I remember at the beginning, I was taking ma many notes because, mm. okay, I have to remember that and then and then. Mm. But I couldn't really connect because if you take notes, then you mm. cannot be there. And after a while, I realized, wow, it's just because I'm afraid to, to really offer myself mm. freely and completely open to this situation without knowing anything yeah that's that's the thing so but i have to be also honest that it's a learning process yeah you cannot just declare like that okay i, I will be like that yeah it's impossible i'll be empty space for all of your suffering yeah please come in it on. <laughs> no it's it's a long long journey it's yes. a long process but I'm happy to share today because maybe some of those elements can already water the good, the good seeds in us and to, mm. to take the right direction in a way. Even if we know it will take time, mm. we will maybe also fail in a way. Sometimes we feel, okay, that's my limit. That's my limit. I cannot do it or I have to stop now. Mm. Sorry, I cannot go further. Mm. And it's, you would say it's important that we respect so that important, also. So important. Right. So important. The question of limits, if we go on this point, mm. uh, has been very present in my mind when I, when I was a psychotherapist. Mm. I was uh, very aware that my capacity also to offer that at that time was limited. So I didn't receive so many people during one week, for example. Mm. I had a limit. It was like maximum 20 people in one week. 
It was very rare that I was uh, I was between 15 and 20 people because every session was more than one hour and it was enough for me. Mm. And I was com- I, I combined that with some group therapy works with some mm. uh, trainings for psychotherapists or for people around. So like a kind of mixed um, propos- propositions to to not take so much uh, from myself also in this kind mm. of one-to-one sessions because I thought mm. I cannot do much. And this is a very important thing. I, I've seen some of my colleagues uh, uh, doing too much in that direction, taking too much people, and then af- mm. after a while being completely closed, you know. You, after a while you have to protect yourself. You cannot... Mm. You cannot be in, in the, that, that posture mm. anymore unless you, you are fully awakened. Mm. But uh, I'm not, and most of the people are not. So it's completely normal to have limits and to accept them. Right. So you to both respect your limit and also uh, have a path to cultivate that inner knowing and that inner space so that you can offer it to... Yeah. To the people who come to you. So talking about the this, you told me uh, a bit. You were working uh, with other uh, psychotherapists. Yes. Um, and you had different ways of talking about yeah people who came to you. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I thought that that was quite interesting. If you. Yeah. Could yeah, you? it's interesting because uh, I really, really don't like to put labels on things, on people, mm. especially. And I, when I start my, my, my career, I realized that all around me, people were putting labels on people because we, we try to define. Mm. So in a way, we need that. I agree, we need to define things to be a little bit maybe more clear about what, what it is. So psychological diagnosis. Exactly, yeah. so like uh, or schizophrenia or paranoia or, or bipolar. bipolar or everything. So And, and also you see after a f- few years, new, new words appear, mm. uh, new concepts, new way of defining. Mm. So I think as human beings, this big tendency we have, mm. we try maybe to reassure ourselves with that. Mm. But I couldn't, mm. I couldn't, because I had the feeling that I'm putting you in a box. Mm. And I, probably because I went through this burnout, I touched that I don't want anyone to put me in a box anymore. Mm. And I don't want to put myself in a box. Mm. So how can I dare to do that for you? Mm. So I remember going to meetings as well, I shared the other day with my colleagues and saying, mm. okay, guys, I, I won't use these labels. I won't call the people my patients. Yes, so some were calling them patients and some other clients. Clients, right? yeah, so, yeah. So it was quite shocking I think, in a way yeah. for me. Yeah. So I was looking for a word and I arrived to the word seeker. Seeker. Yeah. So we are both seeker. Mm. And, uh, and so that's what you would tell to people who came to you yeah, for yeah, therapy. Yeah, exactly. So... You, you are a seeker, I am a seeker. And I, and I said to my colleagues, okay, I will use that. So at the beginning, they were laughing at me. Yes. But I saw after a while that some of them really understood and even changed their, their words to mm. use this one. Mm-hmm. And I felt much more comfortable with that mm. because we are just on the path of liberation, on the path of understanding mm. and love. And we just try to find the right way. Mm. So in that, that way, we are seekers. Yeah. yeah. Because also for you as a human being, for your personal integrity, you don't feel like putting yourself as some kind of all-knowing authority figure. And, and that there's something... So maybe I, I can talk here about my own uh, experience mm-hmm. as a teenager going to psychiatrist and then two or three psychotherapists. Um, I was very young and I was at the lowest point of my life um, mentally, spiritually and I came for 
to those people f looking for help and my experience the overall feeling was very um, humiliating in a way because of their posture mm. exactly what you, and again um It's not for me, to, I'm not saying this to condemn a, any individual. Um, and I know that many people uh, seeking professional help have very different experiences than, mm -hmm. than, 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 I, I, than mine. Uh, but for me, that's exactly what you're describing, the posture. You know, people just taking notes and literally putting you in boxes and feeling also that they felt also uncomfortable with maybe mm. with uh with me with what i was experiencing and also what that brought up stirred up in them and also that um refusal to just connect as a normal uh in a normal human way and or even to acknowledge that oh yeah you know that's that stuff and I'm not sure exactly what can can help you but we're gonna try something there was a bit of a, a condescending mm. uh, disempowering <coughs> and that's why that's why one of the core values of this channel is really this empowerment mm. uh, and that's why I love the word you use a seeker now, now I'm a pilot and you can be my co-pilot and you'd be happy to make but I'm, because in the end we mm -hmm. each the pilot of mm -hmm. our own lives right mm -hmm. and um, so I really thank you for that and and maybe some of our uh, therapists watching this might find inspiration mm -hmm. in, in this world the seeker because words do have power yes thank you for for your sharing brother it's uh it's very relevant and um, listening to you I, I, I touched something that was quite difficult at the beginning to, to accept mm. it's uh, being powerless touching this feeling of being powerless as a psychotherapist it's so difficult mm. for many reasons but one maybe the, the, the most important one is that people they come to you Mm. because they want a result you know they want you to fix their problem mm. because we are so used in the in the western world to have to go to the doctor mm. and the doctor will will save you will give you what you need you don't need to put any effort they just give you the right pill and you're fine mm. so the, the the people arrive most of the time in front of you as a psychotherapist with the same mindset so, what do you do for me? Mm, fix me. Fix me. You know, yeah. it's even... I paid for this. Even sometimes it's expressed, but sometimes it's not. But I pay for it. I pay 50 euros, 70 euros. So you have to give me a something, mm. a result. And at the beginning, I misunderstood my posture. So I tried. Mm. You know, I have to be worthy of that. You give me some money. You mm. give me some time. I have to produce something. Mm. But I realized it's not the way. It's the contrary. I have to accept that I don't have any power. Mm. Any. I don't have nothing. Just my, my only offering is my love, my presence, my care, my availability, my experience in a way. Sometimes it's useful. But I remember touching many times this feeling of being powerless and even sweating, you know, feeling, checking, my, my body checking because I felt so uncomfortable. Mm. You listen to someone for one hour, you have a whole description of suffering and you have an empty mind. Mm. You don't know what to do. You even don't know what to say. Mm. When you are a psychotherapist, then the people will give you the money and, mm. and, and then they expect something from, from you. It's mm. very difficult, but it's very interesting. 
And it's the same when you listen to someone. Mm. Please contemplate this aspect, accepting with humility that you are powerless and you don't need to be powerful. And it's empowering. So it's completely crazy because you think, it's okay, counterintuitive. Con completely counterintuitive. I have to be powerful. I have to know. I have to develop my knowledge. Mm. I have to be more wise or what, whatever you want. You know, having a PhD of things, then I can offer something. But it's the contrary. The, the most you let go of that, the most you rely on something that you cannot grasp, you cannot master, something will happen. What? What? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the mysterious yes. of life. <laughs> something you cannot fully define. Hmm. We try, but... Are we sure that we can really define a healing process? Mm. I'm not sure. Mm. There's so many factors, no. so many aspects. And one of the aspects we know from many studies is the relationship, mm. the quality of the relationship. Even in the uh, allopathic world, even in the medical world, there are so many experience mm. with the placebo yeah. proving That's the relationship. Beliefs. If I trust that you can be healed, and if you trust yourself that you can be healed, mm. there's already an increase, an amazing increase of possibilities. Mm. Right, because we, every form of life has this capacity for self-healing, homeostasis, regeneration and resilience resilience adaptation and it's not something that can be fully grasped by the intellect because there's much more intelligence in our in ourselves that that the intellect can grasp um, so what you what i hear from you is that a big part of the he the healing process is noticing when our minds gets into fixing mode, labeling, analyzing, and thus disconnects from the present moment. And so we would, it's kind of like maybe soap bubbles, or I noticed, boom, it pops, and you're back to reality. And, and in reality, we make space for these self-healing mechanisms. And yes. so when, I know, because I, I have, And I guess uh, hopefully we all have these experiences of someone listening to us and we feel, oh, okay, a burden's been lifted off our shoulders and we can talk about things. And even if they don't have great advice um, or things are still not un un unresolved, but something has moved, something's been flowing and that's already... Mm. Uh, healing and there's a big thing that you told me in the past that really helped me uh, with my practice of listening and that's the notion of trust mm -hmm. meaning that uh, for me as a listener I should it ask myself even if I have a great advice that helps the other person Is also at which price? Yeah. Is it at the price, at the expense of that person's self-confidence? Because if it is, then it might be not be worth it. Mm. And um, so why don't you expand on that a bit? Because that, that really yeah. helped me. It's, it's a very important aspect. Uh, first, because it's a process. So process need time. Mm. They need time, they need patience. So even if you finish the, the deep listening session or you finish the psychotherapy session, you see nothing. Mm. You have the feeling there is nothing. No result, nothing fixed, nothing changed. It's not true. Mm. Because that will unfold slowly. It takes time to process the thing. And uh, so trusting is very important. Trusting that there is a life force somehow. In French, we said uh, elan vital, this, this mm. 
this vitality there and this this life force acting from space that luckily we can mm. never uh, either grasp or damage mm. we, we even if we think we are damaging everything now on the planet we are making so much uh, mess around there is one space that I can call maybe the life force or something like that that we cannot taint we cannot mm. we cannot break you know mm. so this is this is the trust uh, this is a very important thing and I remember many situations when I was a psychotherapist especially that listening to someone I had a kind of understanding of the situation of the person coming from my intuition like okay now I see in a way I see more clearly where you are at I see more clearly maybe a way I can help you to go in your understanding but most of the time especially at the end of my career mm. I, I said most of the time because sometimes I, I, I did differently but most of the time I was refraining myself mm. to share but I was keeping that in my heart mm. like if I was the one keeping track on where we are going but offering you the whole space to discover by yourself mm. and accepting maybe that I was wrong mm. also but I discovered many times I was I was not wrong, I was right. Mm. But it's still much more valuable than the other person. Much more valuable because they keep their self respect because they don't they don't they don't have a, uh, the belief that I can't deal with stuff myself. I will always need someone else. Yeah. And I did the same uh, with my daughters mm -hmm. in the way I, when I the way I, I relate to them. Any any difficulty they had, any problem, I was just exploring with them. How do you feel? What do you mm. want to do? What is your understanding? What kind of actions you want to take? If if they needed some guidance, but and sometimes the temptation was so big to say, "Oh, you can do that," or even "I can do it for you." Mm. <laughs> you have a problem with this. Teacher, I remember once mm. uh, Elia had a very strong difficulty in the relationship with a teacher, and the temptation to go there and to fix the problem mm. face to face with this guy mm. was so strong because I wanted to relieve my suffering mm. because I saw my daughter suffering. Mm. But I said, no, 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 she has to do it. She has to learn mm. from that, and maybe she will continue to suffer for a few weeks. Mm. And that was the case. Mm. But at the end thanks to the way we relate together and the way I, I was mm. able to listen to her and to help her to understand the situation, mm. one day she came and she said, you know that, now I have compassion mm. for him. Mm. And I don't react from, from inside. I'm, mm. I'm free from that. Mm. And I cry. Mm. Because I was like, wow. Mm. And still now I can touch that because it's, such a gift when you see that someone you love, someone you are, you have you have really a deep connection with, touch this kind of mm. deep inside. I can't be free from that. And now I have compassion because I see there is suffering in him. Mm. Whew, I was really that was really deep. So I was so glad mm. that I could manage my suffering in regard to her suffering. Mm. Because we are just in front of a mirror all the time. That's also one thing we have to accept. Mm. That being in relation with someone is, is looking at ourselves at at in the mirror and seeing things. And it's true, even if you don't want to listen, you're still in front of the mirror. Mm. I'd love to know how did your practice of meditation... Um, impacted your capacity to listen to mm. other people whether in your clinical practice or with your family and friends yeah thank you for for this question i i'm lucky because as i said i went through this burnout before becoming a psychotherapist before having a family so my practice was already there 
I learned uh, meditation in the, in the Himalaya with the Tibetan monks in Dharamsala at that time. And it was such an amazing discovery for me that I, I was able to be with myself without being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So the combination between yoga and meditation at that time, uh, I brought that back to my life. And so it was very rare the moment where I was not able to take at least 30 minutes every morning to meditate. Mm. So m meditation practice uh, is so, so important. First of all, because this is a kind of check-in, you know, where I am at today. And some days you wake up and you don't feel so good. Maybe it happens to you. It's not so easy every day. You have maybe some dreams or something happening in the night or a relationship with your partner or something. And so starting your day with this courage to sit and to ask yourself, mm -hmm. where I am at? That means that what I will offer to the first people coming in my, in my room, mm -hmm at 8.30 or 9 for my, f my first appointment, what is the energy I will offer if I don't develop this capacity to be aware of myself? Maybe I'm a bit grumpy this morning, maybe I have some pain in my body, maybe I have some pain in my heart. And this mindfulness practice is fully acceptance of what it is, then you feel right away. It's okay. It's okay. I don't have to be another person than that. This is who I am this morning. And even I will engage that in a relationship with the person. Mm. I did that sometimes. Like acknowledging, like acknowledging, I'm not in my best this morning, I'm a bit grumpy, I'm sorry. Yeah, even, even, even in another way than that, there can be, there can mm. be that, but even like seeing at, right, at a moment in the relationship, in the exploration, mm. uh, sharing that, uh, wow, I, I, I feel a lot of tiredness in my body. Mm. So maybe you feel it also. How do you feel when you have a psychotherapist mm. tired in front of you? Mm. Is it okay? Mm. Can, you, can you be with that? Mm. I, I, you, you see, this kind of uh, uh, true way of relate to someone. Mm. Not being in the kind of mood that we fake everything that's yeah. what we have because we been, feel it yeah we have been s educated like that we have to fake mm. but you feel it if if i'm not so powerful in my energy this morning or if i'm a bit sad or, you will feel it so the best way is to to share that not you don't need to apologize just like mm. sharing and seeing how the person in front of you will take it and i saw in different situations that was uh, a turning point because mm. for example if your dad or your mom was always tired in the morning mm. and then suddenly you have a tired psychotherapist in front of you you see what you can touch mm. what kind of, of emotions mm. in, in yourself or um, yeah having someone carrying a lot of sadness and um, kind of depressed energy you know a little bit Wow, that's interesting. So, coming back to your question, practicing meditation every morning was so important also to really acknowledge where I'm at and to, to offer what is there to myself and to the world. And also, something I did uh, in my, in my uh, practice field is that so most, most of the time, my, my, my sessions as a, as a psychotherapist were one hour, sometimes one hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Because some people were coming from very far sometimes, so I, I was able to take them for long, but mainly one hour. And after one hour, I had every time I had a break of 15 minutes. So I never took two seekers at the row. Mm. Doesn't look much 15 minutes. Mm. But for me, it was so precious time because 
I was using those 15 minutes to practice walking meditation. In your office? No, outside. Outside? Because my office was really uh, in front of a garden, a beautiful garden. So every time I was using that 15 minutes or 5-10 minutes, sometimes because it was a bit shorter, just go around, walk a little bit, practice walking meditation, coming back to my steps, my 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 freedom in a way, you know, it's like, okay. Mm. And letting go of what I heard, what I touch in this relationship and prepare myself to welcome the next one. Mm. And that was very powerful. And the, the person could, could feel it. Mm. But most of my colleagues, they don't do that. They just go from one to another. So from eight, nine, nine, ten, mm. ten, eleven, and there's, the, there's no break. Mm. I cannot. I cannot. Maybe maybe they can, but I cannot. Because I I I feel how important it is to refresh myself, to come back to myself, to check in again where I'm at. So meditation practice, as we teach here in Plum Village, is not only on the cushion in the morning. It's all the way through. Mm. all the day in everything so yeah actually mindfulness mindfulness uh, changed my 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 way of being as a psychotherapist for sure mm. yeah especially when I uh, start to practice here with Plum Village mm. uh, in 2007 so mm. uh, 14 years ago I, I saw uh, I saw really a big difference in my way mm. of also being first and also accompany the, the people in that setting. Yeah, mm. in that setting. I'd love to come back on something you said earlier um, and also trying to put myself in the shoes of maybe uh, uh, therapists watching this. Um, you talked about when you listen uh, deeply, you can touch some ultimate and this feels extremely spacious and you're not tired and you feel refreshed and you're not overwhelmed. You don't feel like you have to take on the other person's suffering. And some of our friends hearing this might think, uh, really, that sounds great. But for one is, okay, let's be honest. Like, is it really like that? Or are you just sending me some meditation, whatever? Uh, so if you could bring more context, is it always like that? And more importantly is how do I, how do, I do that? How do I, do, how do I actually enjoy that space without feeling like I take on the other person's suffering with me and I bring it home and I carry it and I just stay busy having to find solutions for mm. for my patients. Yeah, thank you for this uh, feedback. It's very, very important. Because first of all, the, the, the trap in that could be that I, I aim to be in that posture, always being free, mm -hmm. being like, okay, nothing touch me, I'm fine, mm. I'm in the ultimate. <laughs> Uh, so I hope I hope I, I, I didn't give this feeling because it's exactly not what I feel mm. and what I um, would like to share. Mm. It's it's not something I aim. It's not something that appears after a while, mm. or not, mm. or not. Mm. Sometimes yes, sometimes not. And you cannot grasp it. You cannot decide it. You cannot make it. Mm conditions you know sometimes mm -hmm. it's even i can use a world a very crazy world sometimes this magic works mm -hmm. sometimes less mm -hmm. sometimes not mm -hmm. but there is one magic that works all the time is mindfulness mm -hmm. acceptation where i am at now maybe i'm a little bit caught in my thinking maybe i'm a little bit trapped in my way of wanting you to be different than you are. Mm. Maybe I'm a little bit too much 
um, myself already moved by some stuff that I cannot be free, that I cannot really be available in a relationship. Everything is okay. The more you will accept what it is, the more you will accept what is right now in front of you or in you, the more you will touch this mm. thing I described at the beginning. Mm. So I hope it's clear. Mm. It's not something I try to achieve. It's not something I try to grasp. Mm. It's, it's just something that will appear if I practice mindfulness, mm. if I practice acceptation, if I practice embracing mm. everything at every moment. Mm. At every moment. And, <clears throat> sorry. And the things, as you know, are impermanent. So they change all the time. Mm. So I hope it's already mm. a little bit more clear. Yeah, it's not something we do. It's something that happens when we tune in the reality of what's manifesting, our sensations, <clears throat> the person mm. in front of us. And I guess... For that magic to happen <coughs> is, you know, it takes two mm. to tango. It's not just about me being fully connected to myself and to the present moment. It's also about the other person being mm. fully connected mm. to, the, to their feelings and also owning their feelings and being, being fully in the in the in the flow of the moment. Mm. But because, I, because I, <coughs> yeah, it, what. What what happens, for instance, when you feel you feel connected to yourself, you feel open, but you're under the impression that the other person is a bit disconnected, a bit too in their thinking, and not really in touch with their with their emotion. How how do you navigate those situations? Mm. Yeah. So. First, first, I really invite you and invite us to taste what it is to really listen in a deep listening session without saying anything. Mm. Did you already experience listening to someone for one hour, two hours? Tai, Tai, our teacher said that without saying nothing. Try and you will taste something. Mm. really it's amazing maybe it's not so easy as I said it's not so comfortable but we accept it and we go through that process so that said sometimes when I feel that that can be helpful just to help someone to come back to his body mm. I do it when I see exactly what you described someone mm. who is already completely overwhelmed By, by his mind, by the, 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 the crazy radio there, you know, always speaking, I use the practice of mindfulness to help the people to just slow down a little bit, come back to their body and just check what kind of sensations do you have now. Mm. Because there is true that sometimes we get caught in our stories, we get caught in our our thinking and it can be very helpful if you are someone that just help you to go back to your sensations mm. but it's not something you have to do every time mm. so be careful because sometimes you feel oh this is the, the proper way you know mm. I need to, to take this person back to, to their body mm. but for some people it's impossible so uh, again it's by asking the person you're listening to, um, what are they feeling in their body at, at this moment? Yeah. So, for example, I will say something like that. If you feel it's possible for you right now, mm. I would like to invite you to, to just go back a little bit to your body and to your sensations, if it's possible. Mm. What, what is there? Mm, like a guided meditation like a bit of guided meditation and some people they will they will just go there and they will start to enjoy being with that like mm. touching something and they will start to describe so we go into something more more in a way deeper mm. not too much minded but a little mm. bit more deeper in the sense uh, feelings 
you know. Mm. But some people, they would just try, they would try, and they would just go back to the mind. Yeah. They cannot. It's too much. And that's okay. Mm. So, also, it's very, it's very non-violent way of doing yes. things, you know. It's just like a proposal. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. If, if the person cannot do it, then I will do it myself. Yes. Okay? So you go back to your mind, it's okay. But me, I will stay in my sensations. Mm. And I will offer that to you. Mm. So how do you do that? So instead of being overwhelmed by your mind, mm. like I said at the beginning, and trying to follow you and trying to mm -hmm. follow your story and stuff like that, mm. I will just take, take that maybe as a kind of music it's a bit crazy maybe to say that, but a kind of sounds. I will not put my energy to try to, to follow you in a way, but I will put my energy to follow the sensations in my body, to mm -hmm. touch. And then you will realize something interesting. Sometimes you will have a pain, a tension. You realize that suddenly you have a tension here in your stomach, listening to that person. Mm. and as I said at the beginning because we are not separate then this tension is related to what he's saying mm. and already welcoming that tension being with that tension in myself being able to embrace that is offering something to the person even mm. if she doesn't know he doesn't know what I'm doing mm. and sometimes it's also the same as a psychotherapist I remember I formulate that uh, I share that in a relation you know mm. while I'm listening to you now mm. while I'm touching in my body it's a strong tension in my stomach can you feel it or is it something that you already ex experienced in your life before having this kind of tension so it can be also a, a possibility but Again, be careful with that. I, I prefer for now to, to invite you to be in the posture or just trust the, the fact that if you acknowledge what is there in yourself, then you're already offering something to the other, even if you don't say. Just yeah. through your presence. It's the same. There's an, an image coming to myself. A few years ago, I... I lost one of my best friends from a, a cancer. So I went to the hospital. I was already a monk and actually he was one of my best colleagues. So he was also a psychotherapist and uh, he had also a spiritual life. He was a uh, Catholic. And I remember I was there sitting with him at the hospital. He was not able to speak too much because it was too difficult already. But just connecting from our uh, eye contact and also the energy. And at what time, at what moment he said, I, I need you here because every time the people enter in the room, they arrive with so much um, how can I describe that? Like so much of uh, trying to do something for me mm. that that makes me, uh, that puts me in difficulties. Yeah. Uh, that like, I have to manage the relationship with them to, to reassure them that everything is fine. Yeah. And he said, but when you are there, mm. it's completely different. Mm. And I know you, you offer me something completely different than the mm. people will feel and then it will, through you, they will be able to feel it also and to offer to myself. Mm. I don't know if I describe it well, but I was so touched by that. Because mm. in myself, the only thing I was doing sitting there for hours is accepting. Mm. Accepting my feelings, accepting to see my friend in that condition, accepting that he would pass away soon. Mm. And I was free. Yeah. And he could feel it. And when, at once he said that to me. So precious what you're offering to me, this freedom. So maybe this is one thing we didn't speak about, but this mm -hmm. is this is the most important thing we can offer: non-fear, freedom. Yeah. And it's linked to trust. 
mm. face what you said at mm. the beginning. It's very true. It's very mm. real. Because acceptance is not resignation. Not at all. It's just being there with what is. Yeah. Fully alive. <laughs> fully alive. Yeah. Actually, I was fully alive. Mm. And happy to be there. And for people who... I've heard this a lot for people on their deathbeds. Yeah. Uh, they often said to their family that's the only thing I need from you right now is to just accept <laughs> I'm going and also there's something about when you're in a dark sp s place inside yeah. uh, to be with someone who knows what you're going through they actually can feel what you're going through and they're not afraid mm. There's something extremely powerful already, already, already in that. Yeah, that's very powerful. And that's very powerful also coming back to the deep listening session or to the psychotherapy session. It's, it's exactly what we can offer. Something in me knows that everything is okay. Hmm. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're facing now, but I can offer that okayness to the situation. And then you feel it. You, mm. know? you feel it. Even you are, you're on your deathbed or you're very sick or you have a cancer because I, as a psychotherapist, I receive people who are also in these conditions, a strong sickness, you know, knowing that they will survive or not. But if, if they're touching you, that you, 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 you don't have fear, that you're already okay with everything, then suddenly... <sighs> you open the door for them. Wow. Mm. And, and I did it by phone sometimes. You even don't need to have the presence of the person, you know. Mm. It's, it's quite amazing, actually. And I hope you will be there for me when I will be on my, my last breath <laughs> to offer that to me For you know? sure. we're, not, we're not sure who's <laughs> gonna she's gonna go first yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's why that's why also it's empowering because in that field we have a lot of power mm. So, Brother Kainess, I'd love it if we could uh, extend our thoughts to some of our friends um, listening to this right now. Maybe they have a loved one who is struggling with mental health. Mm. So, let's say <laughs> I'm a parent watching this and my teenage boy or girl is going through a severe mental health crisis maybe they're saying stuff that doesn't make sense to me that worries me how do i as a parent or as a spouse or a brother or sister <clears throat> how do i make space for that beloved one mm. while respecting myself wow this is a beautiful question thank you but I promise for that. I don't know if I can answer to that, actually. Mm. But I have some, some elements I can share. First of all, I would like just to acknowledge that it's a very challenging situation. Mm. We have to be very honest. It's very difficult to have a loved one mm. going through this kind of uh, situation. Mm. It's very challenging because we have a lot of um, fear in front of that. Especially for the future, we think how, mm. how, it will, how it will be, how this person will be in the future. Will, will be uh, my son or my daughter or my partner or my brother able to, to live a normal life in a way? So, mm. And being able to be happy and things like that. So. First of all, I think it's, uh, we have to be very careful not to project ourselves in the future. It's mm. right now, it's like that, but mm. everything changed. So that is the first thing. 
don't be being caught in the fact that this will stay for long for long lasting for all life mm. all can change mm. even even if we have a kind of severe diagnosis about things mm. i don't believe in that mm. because life is a miracle and the second thing that's regarding to myself in my in that situation mm. is that there is one fear we have deep inside of us a very strong fear we are all fearful to be crazy yeah all we have this and it's coming up in our life mm. many 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 just times just lose it yeah just to be out of control mm. to be uh, unable to face reality to face my responsibility so it can mm. develop itself in many ways but this fear of mm. becoming fool or becoming crazy uh, to lost control is really deep there mm. really deep there so I would say if you have this situation in front of you someone who is getting a little bit out of control in a way because of health mental health reasons and having some behaviors like you described, you know, saying mm. some, some things that we, we don't understand or mm. acting in a way that's very weird. Mm. Uh, please first take care of yourself. Mm. So that means being courageous enough to touch the fear of losing control, of being yourself a little bit uh, out of track mm. or crazy. And if you have the possibility to, to go to a psychotherapist or to go to mm. someone that can help you in that field, mm. please do it. Mm. Make sure that you have the support of someone mm. to face that. Because I feel if in my life I have to face that reality of a human being that is very dear to my heart in this kind of disorder or this kind of situation, that's because I need it. That's something I will learn. Mm. I have a good friend. She is uh, a mother, so she has two, two boys and one daughter. And her daughter is autistic. And now is her daughter, she's like 18, 19 years old. And, and she has a lot of, really a lot of uh, strong behaviors like even mm. beating uh, okay. you know like it's because she's most of the time overwhelmed that, by her emotions the, the, mm. the daughter mm. and so I'm, I'm very close to her and I, I was many times I was there also supporting her and and one thing that helped her a lot the, the mom is to accept that her daughter is a master mm. and that she as the mother has the capacity to learn from this master mm. and it's amazing she changed completely her way of being in that situation and she learned so much she developed so many things in herself the mom like, for example, uh, uh, a kind of hypersensitivity, so a mm. capacity to touch what is there and to, to, to see the, what I could say, a low signals, for example. Mm. Subtle signals. Subtle signals, observing right away that something is shifting in, in, in our daughter and if if she doesn't realize that now, that will lead to something mm. stronger. So this kind of capacity, now she has a kind of hypersensitivity, or mm. I don't know how to, to describe it, but something mm. like that. For example, it's, it's amazing how she, she has that. And also um, developing, uh, she, she has been able to develop also a, a way to touch her daughter, for example physical touch like to to massage the, her feet so she learned from uh, mm. this kind of technique so she learned many many fields using plants mm. using uh, uh, also uh, 
um, some some stuff around the energy mm. fields, you know, like bioenergy or energy something. healing. Yeah, energy healing. So, <coughs> and she she said to me, "Wow, what I learned with my daughter is amazing," and she's mm. still learning. So I give this example to say that if I fully also accept that it's not a burden, but it's a gift. It's something here in my life because that's what I need mm. to continue to develop myself, to progress on this path. It's a completely different way of approaching it. Wow. And there is nothing wrong. Also, there is one thing behind that regarding to the neighbors, regarding to the family, regarding to the people, we feel maybe I'm wrong. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't do... Uh, a good job, a as, good a job as a father, as a mother, as a brother. So there's some mm. guiltiness uh, mm. below. So if you can get, if you can be free of that, then suddenly there's nothing wrong. Mm. It's just life. Everything mm. is okay, even if it's not easy. Yeah. Something I, I feel to share is that if you're facing this kind of situation in your family or your friend. Please trust yourself. Trust mm. your capacity to deal with that. Don't um, give the full power, the full trust to someone like a psychiatrist, psychiatrist or an institution. Mm. Because most of the time we, are, we, f we feel, or we think, we don't have the capacity to deal with that. Mm. And then in a way we, f we think that the other people can do a better job than us. But mm. it's not true. Yeah. <clears throat> because the most important thing in this situation is love and care and if your son or your daughter or your brother feel that you you are cap capable to be stable in front mm. of him with non-fear as I said before mm. offering love and care this is the most important thing mm. the rest is nothing even You can have some support from a psychotherapist, you can have mm. some support from a psychiatrist, maybe, mm. but don't dismiss. Mm. You see what I mean? Don't look down on your no. own power yeah. as a mother, as a father, a loved one. Yeah. And I shared before about, about uh, feeling guilty. Mm. So accept the challenge. In a way. Mm. So accept the challenge that will reveal to you some aspects that you're still, carry, you're still carrying from your ancestors, maybe. Like the feeling of being guilty, not mm. being worthy, not having done mm. the best in my life. I could be a better father, or I could be a better brother. Mm. So <clears throat> those aspects are very important. Mm. Please uh, accept the challenge in, in that way. Mm. And then you will free yourself. There's something um, I found a lot in, in my mom. I don't know if it's more the mothers than the fathers, I'm not sure, but uh, also with friends who have um, children is the, the guilt and somehow this uh, narrative that I, as a parent, have full responsibility for my child's well-being and if they suffer it's because of me just yeah. because of me it's a yeah. bit uh, simplistic yeah. narrative and we but as we learn everything comes from many conditions and it's the whole world mm. that's raising a, a child mm. and that's the whole world that's sharing the responsibility for someone's well-being because as a child if you look deeply you will see it's my case and it's probably your case we receive this message a lot from our parents. You make me suffer. The parents saying to the kids, your behavior is not proper, is not respectful, mm. you're not doing the right thing, you're making too much noise or you're making too much mess in the house, you make me suffer. So we have been conditioned in that way with the feeling that we are responsible for the suffering of someone else. But it's not true. Mm. I am not responsible of any suffering of the people around me. Okay, I think it's important. I'm not <laughs> fully responsible <laughs> because we're all 
co-responsible. Is that what more what you meant? Yeah. Because yeah. it's so important that we don't fall into the other extreme of you know spiritual bypassing and yeah well i push i push the limit a little bit uh, mm. by purpose <coughs> but you're right you're right yes. it's it's more a co-responsibility i can mm. i can in a way i have to be aware that my my behaviors also have an impact on you mm. but i cannot avoid to have an impact on you even if i do my best mm. so the thing is that I try to do my best mm. and then I let go. Mm. And if some suffering mm. emerge from you regarding to my behaviors, this is your suffering. I, I can just try to be there. I can just try to embrace it. I can just try to help you. But I don't have to take the burden of that. I don't have to take the, 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 full, the, the full responsibility mm. of that. And the guilt that comes with it. No, because it doesn't help at all doesn't help at all so that doesn't mean I will do crazy things I will do things without taking responsibility of my life mm -hmm. but I make sure I, I make sure that I'm not nourishing this old pattern that we receive from the ancestors that we are all always in a posture that we are producing this kind of suffering yes. to others and yes. that we feel guilty from that So I hope yes. it's clear enough. But yeah, it's so important. And maybe I, s I repeat this my own way yeah, also, please. which is um, we can always contribute, but we can never control. Mm. So whatever I say or do will combine with many other conditions like your past, even <laughs> literally what you had for dinner last night, um, the air different biochemical mm. Mm. reactions your own beliefs your own interpretation exactly to co-create your feelings mm. right yeah so so that's why there's no full control yeah there is a co-responsibility and as you say we do our best but then we also it's so important that we let go and maybe especially especially as a parent or mm. as a loved one where the attachment is the bond mm. is so strong mm. and we we can torture ourselves unnecessarily and also have unreasonable expectations about our, our impact yeah coming back to concrete uh, things i think first uh, as a parent i don't want to see my child suffer It's very difficult to see your child suffer. I shared that before with the experience with uh, my daughter, with a, a teacher. So difficult, so painful when you have uh, one of your beloved ones is, is really in, in trouble and suffering. So this is the first thing, re recognizing that it's very difficult to see someone we, we love in, in, the, in this situation. So the other thing also is that from our experience, we can touch that suffering is good that we need suffering to grow and then we cannot avoid having that in our life even if it's a dream even if we maybe continue to nourish this ideal of uh, happiness world mm. but the reality is not like that mm. I have grown I've grown so much based on my suffering Mm. As I said at the beginning, I've lost my parents. I was a young boy. So what, what, what could be the bigger suffering than that? There's no bigger suffering than that, probably. You're a young boy and suddenly you don't have mother and father gone. But I'm still here and I've, I've learned a lot from that. So also my, my, my trust today is based on, on, on this reality. It's not, it's not a bypassing. It's really touching and that I have the capacity to be with my suffering. I have the mm. capacity to, to embrace my suffering. But it took me 20 years, as I said, before my burnout to arrive to this point. Mm. And slowly I could develop that through the practice, to this day-by-day uh, -day meditation, to this practice of coming back to my body, practicing yoga, practicing uh, exercise. Uh, also, One of the things I do every day is going into nature. Nature is, is my main inspiration. 
that's where I take energy. That's where I recharge myself. That's where mm. I reconnect to beauty. So suffering is there. It's, it's a reality that I, I will not be free from suffering. I can learn from suffering. I will enrich myself in my path from suffering. But be careful. Nourish yourself also. And I nourish myself. Your happiness. Joy, happiness, beauty, creativity, amazing, amazingness, wonder, in, wonder, and stuff like that. Great. It's so important. And I do that every day, mm. every day, every day, every day. Great. Even just lighting a candle in front of myself when I drink my tea, it's already a beauty. Mm. You know, this feeling the, the movement, lighting the candle, seeing the flame, the miracle of life. Mm. Uh, Ty was so happy when he was teaching with the matches, you remember? Mm. Wow. All the conditions mm. are there. It's a miracle. Mm. So nourishing your happiness, taking really good care of yourself, accepting the reality of your suffering, whether it's your own or your loved one's suffering, and also making sense mm. of your suffering or the suffering of your beloved yeah. one, like you said, yeah. your friend who... Um, stay to see her daughter as her master and it's very important that um, there's a whole field of psychotherapy based on this the mm. logotherapy mm -hmm. making sense the story we're telling ourselves and mm. seeing the goodness of suffering seeing the potential for growth yeah. spiritual yeah. growth yeah so dear brother kindness any final thoughts on the topic of presence and deep listening for our listeners I enjoyed very much our conversation <laughs> and I enjoy very much being being with you so my final thought would be gratitude mm. and gratitude is so powerful in my life it's so powerful energy so yeah I Thanks to you, because you are there watching this, this video. And thanks to my brother, I promise I, I could this morning touch uh, connection and, and love and care and, and aspiration to, to, to have a meaningful life. Mm. So that that's bring me to a space of gratitude. Because every time I can, I can have a, a quality relationship like we had now, for two and maybe more hours, I feel so good. Mm. So that's what I tried to describe at the beginning with the deep listening session. It's another format, but it's mm. similar. The way we, we, we have been able to connect all together today, now, in the present moment, it's mm. so powerful for me. And so, so I'm very grateful for that because I feel, I feel very nourished. Yeah, so this is my, my favorite <laughs> touch. <laughs> Thank you. I do feel the the connection, and I'm also feeling really grateful for your beautiful experience. Again, 25 years as a psychotherapist, five years as a monk. It's a lot of of uh, lessons learned, and the reason I invited you is because I've seen you in action. I know that is not just theory. Um, there were times where I came to you for listening, for uh, presence and advice and you were there and that really um, made a positive difference for me. So uh, I thank you for that. 